to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, who organized tonight's event. Um, we are one of many programs here on the Commonwealth Club's uh, website uh, and the YouTube and Facebook channels, which are designed to uh, recreate what we do live or what we have done live in San Francisco for over 117 years. That is to bring a uh, perspective on uh, aspects of public affairs, public current events, and so on, um, but also the history, biography, and uh, other issues that can inform us of what's going on today. So this is one of many, uh, and you can see it uh, either live stream right now, watch it later, and I'd like to welcome the audience that's uh, with us live stream, and I'd remind you that you can ask questions using the chat room uh, of uh, our author. And today's author is Frederick Logavell, who uh, has written a book on JFK. And uh, as he said, there's a lot of new uh, available information. Um, and it's a fascinating rewrite of some of the myths. Uh, some of the myths are strengthened, some of them are undercut. It's a very uh, interesting read. So thank you very much for joining us, Frederick. Um, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Um, delighted, so, delighted to be with you, George. <clears throat> great. It's, a, it's a, a great opportunity to talk about a, a fascinating man and, and uh, how he accomplished what he did. You know, you really fill in a lot of details. I know that some of the details are known, um, but you also give a, a much better, a clear perspective on so many details that, you know, people think, oh, he just because just he looked good and, 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 and was ar articulate, that's why he won. But they, they clearly worked at it for a couple of decades before he got to that point. Um, and... So let's go into some of the family myths first, uh, before we get to JFK himself, because there's a lot of family myths about the Kennedys um, that you uh, are able to either reinforce basically with the information or totally undercut and say, that's not the way it happened. Um, I think the easiest place to start is with the father. Um, we can leave you know, how the, how the uh, Irish Catholic uh, families got uh, to Boston behind, but the father is known. I mean, the image that everybody seems to have of him uh, is that he was a bootlegger uh, and made his money that way during Prohibition. And you, you seem to, you, you have one nice story to explain where that might have come from. But why don't you tell us a little bit about who he really was? Well, he's an extraordinary figure um, and highly influential in the lives of his children, not least his second son, Jack, but really all the kids. And one of the things I found is that, um, though he is... Um, uh, shall we say, uh, complicated um, and has uh, less savory aspects of his personality, which we can discuss, and his uh, sort of mode of operation. He's a very devoted father. And I think that's important in Jack's uh, development. One of the things that I think is maybe most admirable in Joe Kennedy is that he, though he had this dominant personality, he did not insist that his kids pursue this or that career, um, that they have this or that uh, um, political philosophy or worldview. Um, and Jack, I think, took advantage of that freedom, if you will, ironically, in a way that the older son, the supposed golden child, Joe Jr., never did. Um, mm -hmm. But as you, as you pointed out, George, he, um, he made a fortune, um, mm -hmm. an absolute fortune on Wall Street and to some extent in Hollywood, using practices that were not illegal at the time, although many people frowned on them, and insider mm -hmm. trading is probably the most notable, but he showed, um, everybody would say, even his detractors, an extraordinary nose for an ability for, uh, for making money. And the last thing I'll say here is that at the time of the Wall Street crash in 1929, he stood at a safe distance. He had gotten mm -hmm. out uh, in the nick of time, perfect timing, and in fact, in the years thereafter, his fortune rose much higher in the early and mid thirties. Mm -hmm. yeah, is that is it true that there's there's a, a mythological legend or something about about him getting out that that he uh, was having his shoes shined or something like that? Is that is that his legend or is it somebody else's? That you know, I, I yeah, I was not able to verify that story. It's a good yeah. one that 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 a shoe shine boy basically suggested to him. You know, now it's it's, it's getting too hot. Too many warning signs, uh, Mr. Yeah. Kennedy. Um, I left it out because I could not find out whether that yeah. was true. Yeah, I've heard that in several ways, just like you said. And I also heard the myth that that uh, when Kennedy got a stock tip from a shoe shine boy, uh, that he realized that he better get out because if that's you know people are are, right. are investing at that point, 
that's the other version of that crazy. same anecdote. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Kennedy made uh, the father made a lot of money in the stock market, basically. And as you said, then he went to Hollywood. He made uh, pictures, and he didn't try for the, the high end of the picture uh, thing. No, he he just filled up the the screen um, yeah. with the B level. Yeah, and, he, and they proved very adept at churning out films. This is kind of hard to believe. Mm -hmm. But they were churning out films maybe three or four a month. So let's say one per week quite often. Yeah. Um, and as you say, uh, you know, quality didn't matter very much. It was whether mm -hmm. these things would, you know, put butts in the seats. Because mm -hmm. movies we should remember in the 1920s are exploding in popularity. And you mm -hmm. see theaters popping up all over the, the country. Mm -hmm. And he was there to, 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 to make some pretty good money on it uh, and then got out after a relatively short time. But I think what's important about it for us maybe is that I think he took away from that experience in Hollywood the importance of PR, mm -hmm. the importance of image building, and how his kids, and in particular Jack and later Bobby and, and Ted, could use... Um, the same kinds of strategies to boost their own careers. I think that comes at least in part from the Hollywood years of Joe Kennedy. And it's also interesting because it shows that the father had all these connections with Hollywood too. So that later on when, you know, yeah. Peter Lawford years, all that, well, how did, how did the Kennedys ever get to know those people? Well, their, their families were already connected to the Hollywood families from, from the late twenties. So. Yeah, and when, when young Jack and I write about this, um, when he, when he dates um, Gene Tierney, mm -hmm. when he hangs out, you know, at least to some degree with, with screen uh, stars like Olivia de Havilland, mm -hmm. it's, it's really through his father's connections that he, he makes those initial uh, uh, entries, if you will. Um, then, of course, he becomes himself popular and he's fun to hang out with. They like mm -hmm. having him around. But yeah, you're quite right that the father's connections are important to somebody who we should note finds Hollywood fascinating. Uh, Kennedy is, JFK that is, is mm -hmm. endlessly interested, even when he's in the White House, mm -hmm. in what the movie stars are up to and likes to hang out with them. Yeah. So um, let's start with uh, Jack as a young boy. And he's got this father. Um, say a little bit about the mother maybe beforehand, because you're very, very interesting on the mother too. Mm -hmm. She was a, a devoted Catholic mother in a, in a way, and uh, she uh, accepted the husband, at least to some extent, the way he was. Uh, I mean, he was a womanizer. She knew all about it. Um, and she seemed devoted to the children, but she also seemed to run off a lot and leave them in other people's hands. So yeah. I think she's, I try to say just in the book and to show that she is very important in her own right. Uh, I think too often in other biographies and other histories, she mm -hmm. is slighted and there's so much emphasis on Joe Kennedy and for, for good reason. He's so mm -hmm. colorful uh, and he's such an important presence. He dominates the household when he's around, let's face mm -hmm. it. Um, but I think for Jack, Rose is very important. I think he gets his interest in books much more from her than from his father. And he's sick a lot as a child. And so mm -hmm. there isn't much to do in those days other than read books. And he becomes a, a, a voracious reader, which is a, a habit he will have throughout his life. Jackie talks about how he, he was always reading um, mm -hmm. in their home, uh, at the breakfast table, in the bathtub, uh, and so on. Um, so, she, so that comes from her. His interest in history, which I argue is very important, this historical sensibility that Jack Kennedy has and which will become important in my volume two in the presidential years, maybe especially in the Cuban Missile Crisis and the mm -hmm. resolution of that crisis, that comes, I think, from her. He's actually more like her in his personality than his father. He's more, he's a bit more shy. He's a bit more reserved. Um, and then, as you also say, George, we should note this emotional reserve that she has, quite mm -hmm. evident, and that she... Uh, wants to be by herself. She plays golf by herself. She goes on long walks by herself. She takes vacations separately from Joe from an early point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an interesting dysfunctional, I guess it's fair to say that's a strong word, but it's a, it's a, uh, in some ways a dysfunctional marriage, but one that also uh, works in, in, in some respects. And finally, 
she is, as you say, aware of the womanizing, I think from an early point mm -hmm. and has to confront how to respond to, to this um, and, you know, makes it work at least on some level for her. Yeah, you say that she took vacations by herself. You also mentioned that she took vacations that, you know, excluded the children. She'd be gone for three, four, five, six weeks. Of course, they were very, very rich and had plenty of help. So the kids were not, you know, left alone, not fed or anything like that. But, 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 but I, yeah, I think, I think it still was bound to be confusing to the kids, including, yeah. including Jack. Uh, and he, again, he's laid up a lot when he's at Choate prep school. She does not visit. He's mm -hmm. there for four years never comes for a visit. It was less uncommon in those days than what we, what we find today. I think it was, it was uh, practice, if you will, for the kids to be away at prep school. And, and that right. was it. Still, it's pretty striking given how, how sick he was and how many mm -hmm. days he spent in the infirmary. And sometimes he was really sick that Rose um, does not come. Now she's got a full house at home with younger kids. Right. I don't want to make too much of this, but I think there is something to what you're saying in terms of how she approaches this, these long vacations that she takes in Europe in particular uh, by herself or maybe with a sibling or a friend, not with her husband, not with her kids. Yeah, you, you, you contrast her travel there to not traveling to see Jack. Um, I come from a big family, uh, two, uh, 12 kids. And uh, oh, my oh mother, my. Yeah, my mother never visited uh, us in college and stuff like that. For the younger ones, once you know, there were fewer kids, then she started doing it. So um, I think it, you know, that's also a part of it. But of course, if she, my mother never flew off to Paris and bought things either. So, <laughs> so, so that's another part of the alley. So another main character, we, we don't have to spend any time on the sisters, even though the sisters were extremely uh, valuable, helped him and everything like that. But he was, they were more in a, in a, in a subsidiary role and the younger brothers until much later. Um, but the older brother, you know, you, 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 you make it clear that everybody thinks, oh, the father thought, this is the one who's going to be president. This is the one, you know, who I'm going to put all of my uh, yeah. efforts into. And I'm totally devastated that he dies in, in uh, World War II, uh, you know, do, being brave in order to, you know, maybe prove something to me, that kind of thing. Um, but it's really not that simple of, uh, oh, okay, now I have to settle for second best with Jack. Because yeah. Jack was busy all along uh, at this and with his father's uh, interests. And, so, so why don't you tell a little bit about that myth isn't totally wrong, but it's, it's a pretty exaggerated. Right? It's, it's, it's a problematic, problematic myth. Uh, I should yeah. say before I answer George, that the sisters, uh, and in particular, I would say, I would say Kathleen known as kick, right. uh, who is really his soulmate in terms of all of his siblings. She's the one he's closest to dry dies tragically in a, in a plane crash in 1948. And then Eunice, um, Mm -hmm. But the other sisters as well are really important, especially in his campaigns. Um, and so we should, we should, we should note that. But yeah, yeah Joe, um, Joe is the one that is uh, deemed to be destined for greatness by both mother and father. And I think Jack is very aware of that growing up. All the kids are aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, he's movie star handsome. So he's straight, straight from central casting in terms of what a politician might look like. And he's determined to pursue political office. I suggest uh, a couple things. One is that, as you pointed out, that long before Joe Jr.'s death, at least two years that I can document, so in early 1942, soon after Pearl Harbor, but before he goes off to war himself, Jack is musing to a girlfriend about political office. And it's clear that long before that, he's interested in politics. His grandfather, Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, legendary Bo Boston politician, they're mm -hmm. very close. Jack at Harvard chooses for his concentration government. That mm -hmm. tells us something. He flirts with law school, I think at least in part because he's so interested in politics. So we should note that it's not simply, uh, as I think you pointed out, when Joe Jr. is tragically killed in the war, that Jack all of a sudden says, oh, this is maybe something I should do. The second thing I would say is that in some ways he had the better credentials for politics. And Joe Jr. was all too aware of the fact that Jack mm -hmm. had the better credentials. Jack published a, a book, his senior thesis became a, a minor bestseller. Um, he had heroic service in the South Pacific, which we can discuss. I think that really got to Joe Jr. And finally, 
There were, you know, policy pronouncements that Joe Jr. made, um, partly in letters to family, which might have been quashed, but he also said it in other forums. Mm -hmm. uh, he was doggedly isolationist mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I think would not have played very well because he was he was so opposed to American intervention in the war and uh, well after most Americans had shifted. Mm -hmm. He expressed admiration for Nazi Germany in letters mm -hmm. to friends and so on. Um, he had um, a sense of humor that was much more um, sarcastic than Jack's. Jack would wear it, would wear it more lightly. You know, there are various reasons to, to maybe be suspicious of this idea that uh, mm -hmm. Joe Jr., had he lived, would have become a leading Democratic politician. Yeah, it's uh, part of the myth breaking. How I mean, you 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 reinforce the the the, uh, the story of the family's boisterous behavior at home in Hyannisport with all these games all day. You know, twenty four different sports in one day. Some people report, you know, that kind of thing. You know, that the family's just all day playing, 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 as if it's this one big happy boisterous family. But there were several tragedies. I mean, you know, before the end of uh, before nineteen fifty, not only did did uh, his Sister Kick, uh, you know, die in the plane crash, but his brother already was dead, and the sister Rosemary had had the the uh, operation, which which uh, incapacitated her. You know, I mean, effectively, and, uh, effectively, he loses double. her as yeah. well. This is a a, a botched, a disastrous lobotomy, mm -hmm. late nineteen forty one. She is. This is Rosemary, the oldest of the of the daughters. She's only eighteen months, uh, roughly, younger than he is. Mm -hmm. And um, you're, you're so right, George, that um, this is a, a life. One of the reasons I think I was drawn to this as a biographical subject, mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy, is because it is a life full of triumph. But there are also these kind of unimaginable tragedies that he experiences as he's coming of age in those incredibly important years of your 20s and 30s. Um, these siblings all around him. Um, gone or effectively gone. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. The, um, the other myth is uh, that he always got Ted Sorensen to write all of his papers at, in, at Harvard, <laughs> you know, that, that he never really ever went to class, wasn't interested in anything and, you know, did the rich guy thing and have other people write everything. You, you pretty much, I mean, he certainly had help. He had, he was rich. He had steno help. I thought that was interesting that he had, all the, the, the stenographers come in to help him, you know, he dictated his papers and then all that kind of stuff. So that's not the usual. But uh, you made it perfectly clear because of his uh, bad spelling that he, he actually must have written some of them. I, I tell that part. Yeah, I, I think there's no doubt. Going back to some of his papers at Choate, and we don't have that in very many of them, but we do have mm -hmm. a few, that I think you see a guy who has um, an imaginative intelligence, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. as a way with words as, and his mother would say that even when he was a small child his vocabulary was was far superior to the others uh he had a he had an interest in words uh in looking them up uh, and you see especially i think when you get to harvard and especially in his junior and senior year that this is a guy who takes serious questions seriously Mm -hmm. um, and I'm satisfied. I'm convinced that the senior thesis, for example, was was very much JFK's own work, right down to the to the typos and um, some of the uh, grammatical uh, mistakes and so forth. Um, and uh, you know, then early on, as a House candidate in 1946, the speeches on the campaign trail in '46, mm -hmm. most of which he wrote himself are so fascinating to me because they connect not only to our own day, which is something we can discuss in terms mm -hmm. of our politics in the fall of 2020, but they also connect, for example, to his, fav to his famous inaugural address in 1961, which Ted Sorensen Soren Ted did substantially draft along with other people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course he didn't meet Sorensen until 1953. So for anybody to suggest that Sorensen helped him on his Harvard right. papers, uh, that of course doesn't work at all. But, but the point is that he and Sorensen had a had a really important relationship. Sorensen, uh, it's hard to I think exaggerate how much he benefited from Sorensen's help, beginning as a young senator in '53. Mm -hmm. But Kennedy himself, as you're suggesting, from an early point, is thinking hard about really serious questions. 
Yeah. So, I mean, it, whether he was an author or writer, the way we usually think of that, um, or whether he was more like a, a politician writer, but that he really made whoever helped him with the work, that he gave them the ideas. He didn't have the other person make it all up, you know, sort of thing. He, he was behind the whole thing, managing it the way he managed other things at the very least. Uh, I think that was one of the great, you know, uh, sort of myth nuance change. Let's not, let's not look at it this way because, you know, we have, we have so many politicians who pretend that they thought of things when they haven't thought of anything. And, and yeah. uh, it, it's, 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 a crucial, it's a crucial difference, I think, in politics, if you're a thinker or you're not a thinker, uh, obviously, and that, that we don't have to go into all the ramifications of that thought. But <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think if we look at Profiles in Courage as an example, his 1956 book, which um, would not have become controversial had he not won the Pulitzer Prize the following year, Mm -hmm. So in volume two, which is going to pick up the story in early 57, though I talk a little bit about that controversy in volume one towards the end, right. I'm going to go back into it a bit in this next volume. But I think if we look at that book, um, Ted Sorensen was a very gifted young man, mm -hmm. he was 26 years old, roughly, give or take, knew very little American history, uh, was, would not have been in a position to articulate the arguments of Profiles in Courage, the structure of Profiles in Courage, mm -hmm. the kind of organization that the book took, mm -hmm. the particular case studies that they were going to choose. And that is to say, individual senators mm -hmm. who, uh, in JFK's judgment, showed political courage. Sorensen wasn't capable of those things. Um, he did play a leading role in drafting the case studies that are that are at the heart of the book, no question. And they had assistance from two or three professors. But I'm I'm convinced, and I think I show mm -hmm. that it's Jack Kennedy himself recuperating mm -hmm. from, from a very serious surgery, who basically came up with the arguments in the book, um, played a key role, especially in the introductory chapter and the concluding chapter. And Profiles and Courage is just one example. If you look at the speeches, if you look at the articles that Ted Sorensen drafted, um, Kennedy's imprint, I think, is really important. And again, we can see the connections to those early campaign speeches in 46, for example, mm -hmm. when Ted Sorensen is a young, uh, I guess at that point, maybe a college student in Nebraska. They've never met. It's JFK, um, not Sorensen. So it's more like uh, Sorensen got the bead on his boss and was able to take his ideas and turn them into slightly uh, better prose and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, that's, more, that's really well put. I think that's right. I think, again, Sorensen is incredible. And one of the things that's rare about him, um, it's quite rare in Washington, I think, for somebody to be both involved in policy um, formulation how do we mm -hmm. feel about X, Y, or Z policy? Sorensen is involved in that. But he's also then able to turn those conclusions about specific policy issues into prose, into uh, powerful speeches mm -hmm. and uh, concise, clear, elegant articles. Where again, I think Kennedy's imprint is important, but let's not kid ourselves. Sorensen mm -hmm. is vital to the success of those uh, endeavors. So um, let's back up just a little bit again. And um, one of the great scenes that you have is uh, JFK coming back from London when he's a junior at Harvard and he gets off the boat and there's a press conference asking him about what's going on in, in Europe. And you're saying, this guy's a junior at Harvard and he's got a press conference waiting for him. Obviously, his father was ambassador to England, but it's not just that. You know, tell a little bit about, I mean, the, the connections that the family had and that the father shared with his children. Yeah. It, it wasn't, you know, it's not like the children were just there for show. He yeah. had them involved, uh, meeting people. And, and then if JFK wanted to travel, of course, he had the money for it, but he also had the connections. And, you know, he, he just, you look at the research that he did, as you, as you mentioned, for his paper in college. And he did it by going around and talking to all the leaders of, of Europe. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then there's that Pope story. So if you want to tell a little bit about that period of time and the family's connections, I think they're just wonderful. Uh, yeah, this was, this was such an eye opener for me in the research. Uh, of course I had a general sense of this going on, uh, going mm -hmm. in from other biographies and what others have done, but I, it was so striking to me, George, 
to see, as you say, he's a kind of zealot type figure in that he, he pops up in uh, 38, 39, and 40 uh, in the most extraordinary places. And it's in mm -hmm. part because, as you say, of his father's connections, very substantially so, uh, and is already becoming comfortable in front of reporters. As you say, there is this sort of mini impromptu conference when he comes back from Europe uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a Harvard student. 1939, completely fascinating to me because, of mm -hmm. course, we, are, we know this is the eve of war in Europe. And here is young Jack Kennedy traveling across the continent to some extent also in the Middle East. Uh, he, I think, covers about 12 countries in the, mm -hmm. in the lead up to the war. And one week before the war begins, where is he? He's in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, so he is seeing and, in fact, gets a secret message right. from the U.S. embassy <laughs> to take back to London to his father, mm -hmm. basically saying the Germans are going to attack Poland within a week. Mm -hmm. So... You know, it's extraordinary background for a future president. I don't think there's anybody since John Quincy Adams um, mm -hmm. who had this kind of, uh, this set of experiences that JFK even, had from an early, from an early, early age. And even a little bit later, I mean, you have pictures of him in, in, in Vietnam. He, you know, first of all, we have to deal with Vietnam a little bit, you know, a lot later. And it's very important how he did. But as a young man, he was in Vietnam and met the leaders. You know, it's like. How can you how can you replace that? You know, to say we should only pick really wealthy uh, kids, but not ones that stayed in New York the whole time, ones that, that got moved all over. The, and, and I think Joe Kennedy has has something to to be I responsible think for. All that. Yeah, I think you you make two really good points there, George. One is that um, JFK could have been a I don't know what the word would be a beachcomber. He could have been somebody who, because of his wealth, mm -hmm. uh, just remained a kind of slacker. Um, I'm not sure whether his father would have stood for it, but, but let's leave yeah. that aside that he could have, there, there's no reason why somebody of his means would have become this hungry, uh, and this ambitious and be show a willingness to work as hard as he did as, mm -hmm. uh, as, as JFK did. The second point is the, 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 the point about the father that, um, Joe Kennedy helps to facilitate this more than that. I think he wants Joe Jr. And Jack to have these experiences, partly because, and we should mention this, by 1939, late 39, maybe even before that, I think it's clear to Joe Kennedy, senior, that his own political aspirations are probably shot. Mm -hmm. He's not going to be uh, the first Catholic president. He had those presidential aspirations, mm -hmm. but things have gone awry uh, with the Roosevelt administration, uh, with the Chamberlain government, and then the Churchill government, and starting in the spring of 1940. Mm -hmm. And I think Joe concludes, and others have too, David Nassau, I think, in his excellent biography of Joe Sr. says this, that, you know, he's going to channel his ambitions through his oldest sons in particular. So he helps, he helps make this happen. You have a story about that the family knew Cardinal Ag uh, Agnelli, I think his name is, right? Uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and they knew him before. He visited their home in, in uh, Bronxville, New York, when they lived <laughs> near, near New York City. And so the, and, and not only had, had the father met them, but he introduced the kids to him when they were, you know, young teenagers. Yeah, and, then, and then they go to his court, not coronation, but, you know, when he's mm -hmm. in both. Yeah. And then there's the story about Teddy. Tell, tell that story. It's, it's really. Well, so, so yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, here again, you just family. see, you see the, what an extraordinary story the Kennedy, the, the Kennedy story uh, really is. Um, by the way, I'll just say parenthetically, one of the reasons I'm doing this book is that we have, you know, endless books on this or that aspect of, jo of Jack Kennedy's, JFK's life and of his administration. We actually have very few biographies, which is something we can get into. But I thought uh, this is this is an incredible uh, American story, and I want to I want to I want to try to tell it in in, in two volumes. Um, yeah, I think they had met the future pope, and then when they are there in Rome, this is in March of 1939. Um, all of them, except Joe Jr., who is in Spain, which is undergoing a civil war, and he's afraid that if he leaves Spain, he won't be allowed back in. Mm -hmm. so he's the only one not present for this coronation. And um, uh, little Teddy has his first communion, as you and I discussed before we came on the air. Yeah. Um, in a little, you know, little suit 
Uh, and there he is, little Teddy, uh, having his, his first communion from the new Pope. And they're right there with him. And uh, Jack, Joe Sr. in particular, is just completely awestruck by this experience. Yeah. Jack, who's religious faith, we can talk about this, but he certainly wears that faith more lightly. I think he has more doubts. Mm-hmm. Uh, he never, he never um, renounces his faith at all. And even in mm-hmm. the White House, he gets on his knees to pray. Uh, Jackie's talked about this. Um, so he remains a Catholic, but he has these, these questions about it that maybe his mother does not have and other members of the family don't have. But yeah, they're right there in, uh, in the Vatican, in Rome, in March of 1939. Amazing. It's amazing. And, you know, it's a, you write very, very well about Joe Kennedy's attitudes about the war, his perspective on what's going on in the late 30s. Yeah. Um, and there's a context that you put it in. And you also have a, a final view on it. But it, Pope Pius is a part of that story. I didn't mention that because Pope Pius also was seemingly not of the same mind, but sort of thought a little bit like Kennedy, a little bit like Lindbergh, you know, uh, Chamberlain, what they were up to. And why don't you, now that the history is all said, why don't you say how it looked at the time, which is how you do it in the book, and then how it was out of favor. And for yeah. good reason, it, it went out of favor, but that doesn't mean it wasn't an informed thought That's through right. attitude. Yeah. Oh, it's really well. It's, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, basically, it's this in, in short form that uh, Neville Chamberlain, prime minister, uh, is convinced that a policy of appeasement, of, of trying to satisfy what were perceived by many in, 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 in Britain and in France to be legitimate German grievances um, growing out of World War I and the Versailles Peace Treaty, mm-hmm. uh, is committed to a policy of appeasement, believes that ultimately... Hitler is um, amenable to reason uh, and to compromise uh, and to negotiations. Um, he's just, you know, ultimately, he's going to be just like any other statesman. Mm-hmm. Joe Kennedy completely buys this. In fact, he is an arch appeaser. Mm-hmm. He remains committed to appeasement, I would argue, even after Neville Chamberlain himself, when the war begins in September of 39, abandons it. Uh, and in fact, even in the spring of 39, after Hitler completes his conquest of Czechoslovakia, I think both Chamberlain and and Halifax, his foreign secretary, basically shift from a policy of appeasement to deterrence. Joe Kennedy just barrels straight ahead. He's determined to keep the Americans out of the war, the United States out of the war, in part because he's concerned about his own sons. He's worried that Joe Jr. and Jack will be serving and may be killed, and then Bobby's next in line, uh, and so forth. Uh, He has a tendency, and I think this is important about Joe Kennedy, to see national security issues, even as ambassador, in personal terms, Mm. in parochial, nationalistic kinds of terms, whereas Jack develops a much more expansive uh, worldview. Uh, You make it clear that when he was interested in appeasement, that he was not not assuming that England would survive, he was assuming England would fall, uh, and that that didn't bother him too much. Uh, No, and and we should should note that that's a very common view. Yeah. Uh, we, we sometimes forget today how grim it looked, especially when the Fran- when France falls in six short weeks right. uh, in, in the spring of 1940. A lot of informed uh, observers share Joe Kennedy's view. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, another character in that whole uh, group is uh, Charles Lindbergh. Um, yeah. And I know uh, there's a, a novel about what would happen if Lindbergh had been made president and how that would have changed. Philip Roth. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, the, but Lindbergh's um, Lindbergh's role, uh, people talk about him, well, you know, he's a famous aviator and so on, but he was, he was a somewhat political character and, and, oh, yeah. uh, you know, was involved in the politics. Why don't you talk about that part of it too? Yeah. I mean, he, he I think the Philip Roth novel, um, uh, I found it, totally gripping um the 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 series may be slightly less so but but i'm glad (laughs) they they made a a movie out of it but um but Lindbergh becomes close to joe kennedy um they like each other they find that they have the same kind of sensibility they have a a, a, if not a i think in Lindbergh's case uh um or let, let me put it this way both of them have uh, if not a, a, an admiration for Nazi, Nazi Germany, you could argue that they did. They certainly mm. are willing to tolerate 
um, mm. a, a very powerful Germany in continental Europe. Germany can, uh, probably will dominate uh, the continent, and we should accommodate ourselves to that fact. They both mm. exaggerate the power, the, uh, they exaggerate the influence or the potential influence of German air power, uh, mm. and which has, a, I think, a very important uh, effect. And at least indirectly, I think they help shape or Lindbergh helps to shape um, Chamberlain's determination to, to get the Munich in e agreement in, in late 1938. Uh, he has met with Chamberlain not long before that. And this very dire view uh, of what is possible vis-a-vis -vis the Germans, I think uh, Lindbergh articulates. He also articulates to the American public. Uh, and he is, as you point out, and as Philip Roth shows uh, in fiction form, he is one of the most important um, voices for keeping the United States out of the war, come what may, um, mm. really right through uh, to Pearl Harbor, more or less. Well, it's interesting that that dire consequences we have to accept, you know, uh, German air power and so on. That attitude has been because, of course, uh, we won the war. Um, yeah. in, in retrospect, that's considered to be... Uh, not treasonous, but as close to treasonous mm -hmm. as possible. Whereas the dire point of view during the Cold War that the Soviet Union was going to mm -hmm. crush us um, and so on has never been discredited, even though the facts have discredited it, um, because their, their power was even less probably uh, problematic than the Germans' power was at the time. So it's interesting, as everyone says in history, that the winners get to, get to write uh, the history and, and, and say what was the better attitude. Yeah. So we yeah, have, and, you know, we on have that a, point, it's it's uh, it's it's perhaps noteworthy that Joe Kennedy Sr. in the Cold War, now now JFK is a member of the House and is I, mm -hmm. I argue in the book an early Cold Warrior, a committed Cold Warrior, and his father still disagrees with him. So this mm -hmm. this schism that has developed between the two of them in 1939-40, even though they remain personally close uh, and devoted to each other, that never changes. On foreign policy, they differ. And here in the early Cold War, Joe Kennedy raises points that I think more than a few Cold War historians would agree with, or at least, you know, they would accept the premise of the argument that, in fact, he would say, the Soviet Union is not, to in, is not out to invade Western Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe Stalin is no dummy. Joe Stalin is cautious. He's all too aware of his weakness vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. the West and the United States. That's the sort of uh, uh, point of view that Joe Kennedy puts forth. It's not mm -hmm. Jack Kennedy's point of view, but um, but it's there and it's uh, it should be taken seriously. It's interesting, as you point out, how and this is, I think, to great to Joe Kennedy's um, you know uh, respect for him is that in spite of the fact that he disagreed so strongly, he didn't like like some rich people who cut off their sons or do this. No, he. He wanted his son to still succeed, even if his son engaged in exactly the opposite of what he wanted to be accomplished, which is a very unusual family dynamic and shows, as you said, what he puts first, right? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. And, and you know, a cynic, we live in a very cynical age in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. A cynic might say, well, it's probably for show. That is to say, he wants people to believe that he and Jack disagree profoundly on this because it shows Jack's independence. It shows mm -hmm. that even though I have all the money, you know, my son is not beholden to my position. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a legacy of my term as ambassador when I was this arch appeaser. So it could be sort of a, um, a calculation on the part of the two of them, but I don't think I, it may be partly that, but I think, mm -hmm. I think in fact, these differences, and I show this in the book, I believe, these differences between the two of them on mm. especially foreign policy, to some extent domestic policy as well, I think they're real. Uh, I think they make JFK as an aspiring politician uncomfortable at times. He basically wants his father to shut up, mm -hmm. be a little less uh, overt about these things. So I think they're, uh, I think they're real. It's an interesting split that you show in the book uh, for Joe Kennedy between being a not devoted husband, but being a totally devoted father. Yeah. And, and I, I think he really showed that with uh, his, his total misery when everything went wrong with Rosemary's operation, because yeah. that was you know, a daughter. He had no, he had no um, ambitions for her, you know, because that was already clear. And, and yet he, he took it so seriously 
You know, I, I think that that's, it was, it was a great anecdote to put in there to show that side of his character. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, he's a mystery for me. Um, yeah. Because as you say, the way he treats his wife uh, and the example that he sets for his sons, and maybe for all his children, in terms mm -hmm. of how he treats his wife. Uh, on occasion, even bringing mistresses home. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, most of the time he's discreet, but not always. Con uh, uh, contrasted with, as you say, the way he was so devoted to his kids. I mean, it's striking to me that he is in Washington, George. This is before he becomes ambassador. Uh, and he's heading up important new government agencies mm -hmm. in the midst of the depression and yet finds time to write these long letters to his children, mm -hmm. including the younger ones, by the way, handwritten letters that you can find at the Kennedy library, a remarkable mm -hmm. repository. This guy, he didn't, it's true. He didn't socialize all that much. He didn't like to hang out with the Washington high and mighty in the evenings. So maybe in the evenings, he had lots of times for, for, for letter writing, but still mm -hmm. the, the kind of um, uh, importance that he attached to molding the children in the way that he thought they should be molded, to encouraging them in their schoolwork. You know, he tries in vain to get Jack to be more serious about his studies at Choate, long mm -hmm. letters. Um, it's a, it's, he's, a, he's, a, he's an interesting character, let's put it that very, way. Very interesting character and, and, and helpful to understand the way Jack lived his life, uh, which is why it's yeah. so crucial. I mean, you did a great job on that. So uh, there's another question that came in from Gary Landsman. Um, he had wanted to know about the London. We already asked that. Um, he also went with, there's another part of Jack's life that is a lot of tragedy, and that is his illnesses. Um, yeah. his, his Addison's, which he you know, uh, kept aside, all of his back pains. All You, you mentioned before how he was in and out, but, but he, he uh, nearly died a couple of times, too. Yeah. So maybe, maybe talk about the background of illness and the willpower he used to try to, 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 to ignore all that, basically. Yeah, I, I think one of the important points is the one you just made at the end. Um, he is sickly from an, from an early age. He has all the childhood illnesses and then some. Uh, he's in bed a lot. Um, a, lot of this, a lot of these illnesses in school are not well diagnosed. Uh, it's interesting mm -hmm. to speculate about what, what, what might be going on there. But he certainly had these illnesses. Later on, as you say, he's diagnosed with Addison's has it, I'm sure, for many years before it's diagnosed. He doesn't actually get the official diagnosis till 47. Mm -hmm. Back problems that are, I think, to some extent um, congenital. He's, it, one side of his body is longer than the other side, and so it creates, mm -hmm. it creates um, friction and therefore pain, um, but also exacerbated by um, the injuries uh, around PT-109 in the South Pacific. Um, mm -hmm. the, the astonishing uh, ramming of, of his boat by a Japanese destroyer, perhaps a football injury uh, from, from Harvard. So he has these illnesses. And I think two things I would say about them. One, I think they instill in Jack Kennedy a certain empathy. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little similar to FDR having polio and, and it being somewhat mm -hmm more able as a result to see, to put himself into other people's shoes. Uh, I think that JFK has that too. It's at least a cognitive empathy. Uh, we could discuss whether he actually had emotional empathy to the degree that he should. Uh, yeah. these Jackie, for example, and in terms of the woman eyes. Yeah, that was, that's a very sad uh, part of the so, story. So there's a, there's a distinction that uh, somebody trained in psychology, which I'm not, uh, could mm -hmm. make between uh, cognitive and emotional uh, empathy. The second thing I would say about the illnesses is that we could exaggerate their effect, uh, debilitating though they were, and he had last, last rites given to him uh, three times in his life. Uh -huh. He was close to death. I mean, there's no, I don't want to minimize at all, and I don't in the book, the right. seriousness of these. But we should also note, maybe I'll put it this way. This is a guy who, when he campaigned for the House in 1946, started earlier than the competition, worked harder than the competition to get the Democratic nomination, would go all day long, all evening long, sometimes would, you know, exist on four or five hours of sleep per night, day after day after day. You see this in all of his campaigns. So they didn't, 
the ailments did not keep him from having extraordinary energy. This comes from somewhere mm-hmm. in the Kennedy Fitzgerald family um, and didn't keep him from being determined. Maybe they helped him in a sense, become more determined to reach, um, you know, to reach the, the, the next rung on the, on the political ladder once he become, becomes a, a politician. Now, say a little bit about that 46 uh, congressional election and then, and then even more about the Senate election against Henry Cabot Lodge. Yeah. The, the whole idea of the, the teas and the receptions um, and, and that they, you know, yeah. the, how many people they reach for that. It was kind of a brilliant idea. Um, and, and an unusual idea, and it, it seemed to have been very successful. So, and, and people at the time thought, you know, political pros in Boston, yeah. these, these, you know, grizzled veterans of the Boston political scene thought, this is crazy. Yeah. Whoever, whoever heard of uh, having women get dressed up in their Sunday best to go out and meet a political candidate? What kind of mm-hmm. lunacy is this? But these teas, these tea receptions, where tea was served, cookies was served, coffee for those who wanted it, were a huge hit, uh, especially in 52 against Lodge. And Lodge, by the way, came to see how important they were. But you see some of this. There's a there's an initial one in Cambridge, not mm-hmm. far from where I'm sitting today, uh, at the, uh, at the um, Commander, Sheraton Commander Hotel, uh, in which they had, they invited these women to come out and meet the Kennedys, and they came out in droves. So it, it suggests, among other things, that this is a, this is a, a fledgling, political um, operation that is thinking outside the box to use the cliche Mm -hmm. that uh, is trying new things is willing to experiment with uh, political strategies. They're starting, as I said before, they're starting earlier than others. And that too is a key to his success, both in 46 in 52 and then in 60 against Nixon. And in Mm -hmm. before that, in the democratic primaries, he just works harder. He starts earlier than the others, but what the T's show, these receptions show, is that he is especially popular with female voters. Mm-hmm. That's something that they grasp already in 46, and they decide, hey, let's do something with this. And um, I think this is one consequence of that. And he, it, the, the T's and the receptions, which I thought were very interesting, he, he had his mother and his sisters there. Oh, yeah. And, and so they, they all chatted with the ladies. And, that was, and then he kind of was brought in to, to, to talk. Yeah. Well, his mother, uh, you know, she is, she has this emotional reserve. So one-on-one she can seem kind of frosty, Mm -hmm. but man, she comes, uh, there's lots of evidence of this. She comes alive. She came alive when she was in front of a mic speaking uh, at one of these receptions uh, and was supremely skilled as a, as a politician, if you will. Mm -hmm. Let's remember she had grown up, as a as an important assistant to her father, Honey Fitz, she mm-hmm. loved politics. The whole political game was one that she relished. And she, and as you say, the sisters. Mm-hmm. And in 52, let's also note that Bobby becomes absolutely a, a critical mm-hmm. as this wet behind the ears campaign manager. He kind of he kind of rescues a floundering campaign, mm-hmm. uh, Bobby does, uh, and shows his worth. Uh, it's a family. It's a family operation from the beginning. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting about all the Kennedy women. They seem to first love the political part of it and, oh, yeah. and, and, and were good at it. But they also kind of married men that were similar to their father. And, 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 and uh, the mother had, had a father. Rose had a father who was like that. Jackie had a father who was like that. It was like, okay, this is part of the family culture. It's part of the tragic part of the family culture. But it, it was part of the family culture. And as a lot of them said, it's the way all men are. Well, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a good generalization, but it's not accurate. <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're quite right. And of course, not all men were that way. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and, and um, um, the other thing I would just say about this is that um, Eunice, maybe in particular, Rose, let's start with Rose. So the mother, had she lived in a different age, would I think been a formidable politician. Would have, mm-hmm. would have, could have, would have run for office mm-hmm. uh, and maybe reached a very high level. Eunice, I think everybody agrees, including one or two excellent recent biographies, uh, shows that, you know, she has tremendous political gifts and in a different age, maybe our mm-hmm. own age, 
would have been um, a terrific political candidate, her, candidate herself. So let's go uh, before we run out of time. We're only going up to 1956 for those who are listening uh, right now uh, with the Kennedys and the vice presidential uh, attempt when he's a senator. But um, say a little bit about what he did as a congressman, because that was great. He tried so hard to get there. And when he got there, it was like, OK, this isn't very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think it's true. I think when he ran in 46, um, you know, by the way, it's an, it's an amazing, um, for, to me at least, uh, really interesting campaign, in part because of the way it connects to today. And I'll just mention here briefly that even then, skinny 29-year-old mm -hmm. is sounding themes that I think resonate today, for me at least, in terms of uh, what is required in a democracy. So here is this young candidate who says, for democracy to succeed, mm -hmm. we need to have an informed, engaged citizenry, mm -hmm. committed to reasoned discourse between the political parties, committed to the prospect of compromise. We have to have compromise even when we disagree with our political opponents. We need to see our opponents as adversaries, not enemies. All of these mm -hmm. things this guy says that I think we need to hear uh, today uh, maybe more than ever. But you're right. I think once he enters the House in early 1947, I think he finds that it's a letdown. Uh, after the amazing years that he's been through, traveling in Europe prior to the war, serving mm -hmm. in World War II and uh, this heroic service, um, running for Congress before adoring crowds in Boston, mm -hmm. I think he found what a lot of House members find when they're freshmen. Yeah, I'm just uh, sort of a, a peon here uh, and nobody's paying much attention to me. It's going to be decades before I can work up to a leadership position in the House. Mm -hmm. And so I think from an early point, he is already looking at the next rung, could be governor of Massachusetts, but that doesn't interest him so, as much, mm -hmm. or the Senate. Uh, and it's really then a question of biding his time, figuring out when he should seek a Senate seat. And of course, he he goes for the big gamble in 52 and has this epic, very close win against uh, against a formidable Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. It's fascinating, too, uh, when you talk about his freshman year, the characters that he met and thought well of. Another freshman congressman was Richard Nixon from California. Yeah. Same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was Lyndon Johnson just getting started at then, too, or not? Yeah, so, and, so and of he, course, Joe McCarthy. Right. We haven't talked about Joe McCarthy. And Joe McCarthy, yeah. We, we yeah. should talk something about McCarthyism now, but it's because the family connections are so mm -hmm. strong. But it was interesting to see in the book. It's always interesting to watch someone step on stage, whether it's Jay Edgar Hoover as a young man and how I know how these people step on stage as a young man, how they look. And you, you said that, that Kennedy and Nixon kind of could see that the other one had uh, <laughs> a, a future. Basically. Oh, yeah. No, I think, I think you know, um, I think Nixon and Kennedy watched each other. They were a little wary. Mm -hmm. You know, Kennedy used to have these salons in his apartment in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. uh, and he would have as many Republicans as Democrats show up for these dinner. They were kind of informal. Uh, but Nixon was one of the people who showed up. Uh, mm -hmm. And they did have this kind of mutual respect and had it, I think, for a long time. Later, that would change a little bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then and then just to, to, to note that, yeah, McCarthy... Um, you know, the, the, the relationship between Joe McCarthy is a complicated one. He's close to the family. He's especially close to Joe Sr. and mm -hmm. to Bobby. Uh, I don't think that JFK is ever on a personal level uh, close to him. But JFK is, uh, one would say, I would say, overly, overly cautious mm -hmm. in how he treats Joe McCarthy. It takes too long, never really comes out in, in open opposition to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and wasn't exactly a profiling courage on, on, on McCarthy. Maybe. Yeah, not on that one. You, you say that he, he missed one of the votes uh, when he was, you know, and, and his reason was it was a, a surgery or something, one of, the, one of the illnesses. He was recovering, yeah. Yeah, so he had a good reason, but people still still kept bringing it up. Yeah, and he could have, he could have instructed Sorensen to, to register his position on that censure vote. That's in late 1954. Mm -hmm. uh, would have spared himself a lot of heartache from, from criticism from liberals like Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and this is where we see perhaps the uh, overly careful side of this very gifted politician come out. But he might have lost Bobby a little well, bit. Well, yeah, I mean, the family loyal, the family loyal, family loyalties were so strong. 
Mm-hmm. Bobby was, he sort of almost worshipped Jack, that he probably would have kept uh, Bobby and, yeah. and his loyalty. But but uh, Joe Sr., I think, would have been quite upset with him if he had come out in open opposition to Joe McCarthy. So now, now he's a senator, he's 52, and, and even four years after he becomes a senator, what happens? He, he's, he's booted uh, for the vice presidency, and that was also partially a campaign uh, that was uh, yeah. you know, managed by Joe Kennedy, or at least not managed, but funded and, and encouraged. So why don't you tell a little bit about how, how uh, that came about? As, as some people say, one of the best near misses in politics, right? Yeah, I think it ultimately ended up being very much uh, sort of the perfect outcome for him. But yeah, he is increasingly talked about already in late 55 as a as a plausible vice presidential contender. There is already a sense then that Adlai Stevenson is likely to be the nominee again for a second mm-hmm. time. And many people are starting to say, you know, Jack Kennedy brings a lot of attributes to the table. Cut to now the Democratic National Convention in Chicago and a very dramatic moment when Stevenson, who can be indecisive at the best of times, <laughs> decides that the convention should choose the nominee. He opens mm-hmm. this up to the delegates. And I tell toward the end of the book what I think is a really dramatic story about this, this neck, neck and neck race between Kefauver and Kennedy for the slot. Um, ultimately, uh, Kennedy loses and he's upset, he's upset about this. He's a very competitive guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, his father and others say, no, this is the best possible outcome. And I think we would say this, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just add this, that he comes out of that convention in 56 as a star in the democratic party. He had not been that before. He was talked about. He was seen as an attractive potential future leader with a beautiful wife you know, a society wedding in 53 that made all the front pages across the country. But it's only as a result of the convention, a couple of speeches he gives, this dramatic fight for the for the second slot, um, that he becomes this national figure. And not coincidentally, I believe, and this is where volume one ends, um, in Hyannisport at Thanksgiving. Mm. This may be apocryphal, but mm-hmm. I went with it because we have some pretty good supporting evidence. He and his father, uh, after Thanksgiving dinner, hash out the reasons why he shouldn't run or why he should run in 1960. And the Mm -hmm. book then ends with Jack saying, well, dad, I guess the only question is, uh, when do we start? So I think it must have been the answer. (laughs) Yeah, I think that the the Chicago, the convention um, is an important factor in this decision that, you know, next time around, I'm going to seek the big prize. President Obama seems to have torn a, a page from that playbook, you know, because he he became famous from his speech at the convention before he ended up running. Yeah. Right? And the two the two of them are in other ways too. There are interesting similarities between Obama and and JFK that people have commented on that I certainly agree. There's a there's a kind of coolness, mm-hmm. there's a, um, um, a graciousness, if you will, in terms of mm-hmm. how they uh, uh, behave in in public, whether one agrees with their policies or not. Uh, they have they have that kind of thing in common, um, but yes, also this uh, in terms of how they how they reach the national um, the national language. stage at a young age and without much experience. Um, so there's another part of your book um, that I found very interesting because you made several comments along the way um, that uh, Jack Kennedy. Some people said Jack Kennedy seemed to have a heightened sense of being, or you know that that there was. Uh, as if Jack at his wedding did something for somebody else. And he says, as if he had an extra eye on everybody else and or paying attention because here he is caught up in his own wedding, but he, he noticed something was going on and somebody else helped him out in spite of that fact. Um, and I'm kind of wondering what you're trying to get at. I'm, I don't know whether that's in volume two or not, but you, you seem to indicate that he, he as a personality, as, as a you know, human being, yeah. He was a little bit above the, the, the average by a lot. And, and people noticed that all the time. And it made the, the women want to be near him. It made uh, the men want to do things for him because he, he wasn't just, he didn't just get the women vote. He no. had a lot of men that were willing to work for him a lot. So that wasn't, wasn't just his uh, 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 appeal to women that made him a success. So yeah. I don't know if you have another idea, you just mentioned it a few times, but I, I thought it was interesting. Well, I, I think there are a couple of things there, maybe. I do think there is a self-awareness, that he, uh, a kind of self-possession 
that he has mm-hmm. from an early age. There's pretty good evidence for this uh, that I don't think is common in his family. I won't say he's the only one in the family who has it, mm-hmm. um, but he is able to, there's a detachment and that he's able to kind of observe, step outside uh, and, and observe things. So I suggest, I think in the preface, that he's both of the family, mm-hmm. but in a way apart from the family, uh, which I think is an important uh, trait that he has and, and, and provides some insight into him uh, later on. So he's, he's reflective in that sense. In other sense, we, if we had more time, we could just, in other sense, he's maybe not as reflective as what mm-hmm. you might find in a different politician or a different, right. sort of different person. But I think there is that self, there's that self possession that he has. Um, and I think that, um, you know, he, um, he, to, to go to your second point, I do think there is, a boy, charisma is a kind of loaded word, but there is that people are drawn to him. Uh, people mm-hmm. want to do things for him, uh, in that first campaign. Again, we keep coming back to 46, mm-hmm. the number of people who volunteer, um, they don't even know what to do with all of the volunteers they have coming in. Uh, through mm-hmm. the doorway. Um, and I think somebody says, you know, one of his admirers, to be honest, or one of the people who worked for him, so maybe take this with a grain of salt, but I think there's also truth in this, said to meet John F. Kennedy is to like John F. Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, that wasn't true of everybody. Um, right. you know, he beats Richard Nixon by the slimmest of margins, so a lot of people didn't vote for him. But nevertheless, I do think there's something there that helps to account for uh, his success in politics uh, and the fact that he became uh, our first uh, Catholic uh, president. You know, you you mentioned how Bobby came into the campaign. And I think one of the things he did was figure out a way to get all those volunteers, uh, you know, to be effective by going door to door. I I hate to end on a sad note or anything, but but I I thought it was very good how you dealt with uh, JFK and Jackie. And and uh, that that her father was a lot like this, uh, like Jack, um, and that they had a complicated relationship, a lot like Rose and Joe did. And so it, it, I thought that was was very interesting because you, you can tell one of the stories or, or whatever um, if you'd like to. Or well, you probably think, will be going into this much more in volume two. So yeah, no, it is going to be. It's going to be something that, of course, will become central in volume two. It's already important, I think, in the latter part of volume one. Uh, mm-hmm. I think this is. Um, these are two people who love each other. I think that there are to the marriage uh, from an early point, uh, and I think Jack Kennedy admires, to some extent, even envies, but certainly admires traits that and, and abilities that Jackie has, um, her sense of style, her, her intelligence. Um, mm-hmm. she's, she is of, of formidable intelligence, mm-hmm. her linguistic ability. Cause he's kind of, uh, tin eared when it comes to foreign languages. There's so much that I think he likes about her and she helps him as I show in very substantive ways mm-hmm. at key points early in his career. And yet before the marriage, he cheats on her before the wedding. He cheats on her after the mm-hmm. wedding. He cheats on her. Uh, she had been conditioned to believe that this is how men behave. She talks about that in letters, mm-hmm. but I don't think that made it any less uh, painful for her. Right. Um, and um, you know, I'm not trained. I I can't explain fully. I think I give some suggestions, but why he would do this, um, mm-hmm. but. Uh, it does make for some really difficult times along with good times right. uh, in those early years of the marriage. Yeah. Well, it's, for those of us who are there, you know, I mean, the, the image of the young family in the White House was certainly uh, a okay. very positive one. And uh, I happen to have the good luck of, of uh, being seven years old when he uh, was in, uh, when he was in the White House and uh, my father had to go to DC for a mayor's huh? convention. So we, we had a tour of the White House and he oh. walked by, you know. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I didn't so, know that. So that's, oh, as close as I, that's as close as I, you waved to the crowd. He didn't want to stop and say hi to all the mayors. So he was <laughs> on his way to something else. But anyway, um, wonderful. And we, I, I'm really looking forward to, to volume two. Um, I know it probably is a couple of years away uh, if, if uh, anything like the work you put into volume one is, is, is true. But uh, maybe, maybe the COVID crisis will be gone by then. We'll have you in person at the Commonwealth. 
Uh, I would love to come back. I need, uh, and if you can, if you can work on this, George, I need the archives to reopen. Uh, <laughs> all of us, all of us are desperate to be able to go back and, and consult these phenomenal materials. Yeah. They're not open. Well, uh, I'll, I'll ask the president to in intercede for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. That was a great, uh, and a great book. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 118th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you all for joining us.